great to see such a large turnout and so many friendly, familiar faces. Welcome to the Coastal Studies Institute. Um, I'm Jeff Lewis. I'm the horticultural specialist, and I'm going to share a program with you tonight. Um, try to hold your questions until the very end, and we'll have a question and answer period. That way the program will go a little smoother. But it's good to see so, much, so many people here. All right, the, t the program is Feathered Friends in Sleepy Gardens. Um, I didn't want to come up with a title like Garden Chores. <laughs> so, um, tips on winter gardening and bird watching at home. And in case you didn't know, these are cedar wax wings in a Yopon Holly. Um, okay, it's early winter. Right now it's really midwinter, but it's early winter. Um, your plants have kind of finished giving it up. The camellias may be blooming if you've got them but your perennials are looking pretty sad. They're going to seed. And you, you could have been collecting seeds from the fall till, till now. It's still not too late at this time of year to collect seeds. If you're one of those that likes to grow seeds, you know, like native plants from seeds, that maybe they're hard to get on the market. Um, you can buy plenty of zinnias and things, but some of the native plants are hard to find. Um, of course, different seeds have different planting times. Some you wait till the spring. Some you can go ahead and plant in the winter. Um, you can plant them in trays like this for the cover to hold the humidity in. <clears throat> or just whatever you have. Um, a lot of native plants that require a cooling period, a stratification, um, instead of putting them in the refrigerator and dealing with all that mess, I'll just put them in a big pot and leave them outside through the, through the winter. Just cover them with something so the rodents don't get to them. But um, just leave them outside, and normally in the spring, they'll germinate. Um, early winter is borderline of being too late to sow um, biennial seeds so that they'll still bloom the next year. You know, it takes biennials two years to bloom, so um, you're kind of pushing it. But if you jump on it real early in the, in the winter, you may be able to get by with biennials. But it's um, definitely a good time still to plant um, perennial shrubs and trees, as long as the ground isn't frozen, which isn't usually the case around here. It's a good time to divide perennials. Um, this is a big clump of a swamp sunflower. And this is what I did with it. And when you, you know, when you, you, you notice the long fleshy roots, you don't want to just dig a hole and jam those in and all the roots go off in one direction. So what you want to do is dig whatever size hole it takes, and then make a little mound in the bottom of the hole so that you can put the plant on top and kind of spread the roots out. Um, you may want to mark where plants are before they go dormant. You may go out there in March and plant something right on top of something else. <clears throat> and you still can plant um, spring blooming bulbs in early winter. They're not going to bloom the same as the rest of your daffodils, but they'll bloom. In fact, it's kind of nice to have some blooming later. They may even bloom in June, but it's not too late as long as the ground's not too hard to plant them. If you're into lawns and you like to overseed your lawns with annual ryegrass, um, early winter is a good time to do it. And this is definitely a perfect time to take an inventory of all your tools and equipment and fix those broken handles, sharpen the blades, um, service your equipment, <clears throat> you know, purchase, purchase what you lost or broke during the year. And as far as your power tools go, your equipment, um, it's a good idea when you're using them that last time in the fall, that last time in the early winter, it's a good idea if you're getting low on gas to go ahead and use it up, go ahead and burn that gas out of your equipment rather than leave gas sitting in it. And if, if you do leave gas sitting in it, at least add some kind of a fuel stabilizer like Stable or, or this brand. I'm not, I'm not supporting any brands throughout this talk. Just um, some kind of fuel stabilizer and also put some in your, in your gas jug also. That'll save you some problems in the spring. Another little tip is to use non-ethanol high octane gas in your power tools. That helps as well. <clears throat> and don't forget about the cold temperatures that we're bound to have eventually. Um, you don't want your pipes to bust, you don't want your spigots to break, and don't forget to disconnect your hoses and drain your hoses. Um, early winter is a good time to turn the soil in your garden, you know, exposing those weed seeds. 
And our soil is easy to turn around here, thank goodness. If you have tender plants you're worried about, you can put a little layer of mulch around them. But don't clean up your garden too much. If you, um, I, know you're, I know you want to cut all those perennials down to the ground to get things neat and tidy, but if you leave them standing, two things. First of all, some perennials survive the cold winter temperatures better if you leave the stalks on them. But secondly, you know, you leave the weed seeds, the, the weed, not weeds, but the plant seeds there available for the birds to, to eat during the winter. These are pine siskins. Um, speaking of birds, um, you want to keep your bird feeders clean and filled with fresh seed, especially if we have cold spells, bad weather. Um, birds really don't need our feeders to survive. We feed birds for ourselves. We feed birds for our enjoyment. That's why you want your feeders close to the house and all that. But when it's really cold, when we have a strong snowstorm, big snowstorm or something like that, that's when they do come calling. That's when you really can take inventory of the birds you have. And that's when it is important to have your feeders clean and filled. And speaking of feeders, um, we have... We have these, we have, there are tube feeders, which are real popular. There's a regular tube feeder. Here's one that has a built-in wire cage to keep the squirrels out and the larger birds. It also has a little dome over the top to keep some of the weather out. And it has a seed tray at the bottom to collect seed. And um, then hopper feeders are very popular. It's kind of like a little platform feeder with a roof and a seed dispersing unit. They're called hopper feeders. And then we do have, that might be behind the screen, we do have um, platform feeders. A platform feeder can be as simple as some boards on a post that you make at home, or it can be something that hangs like that. But platform feeders um, are really good for a big variety of birds. A lot of birds, like a morning dove, for instance, isn't going to use a tube feeder. They just can't hang on. So it's good to have a variety of different styles of feeders. And I took these pictures at my friend's store up in Kill Devil Hill, Wild About Nature, OBX. Um, bird food, uh, you don't need to write all that down. I'm not going to read it all either, but I, did, I do have some handouts. And somebody was going to make some more copies if you didn't get one. But um, basically, there are a bunch of different things you can feed the birds. I would say the most important of the two seeds, well, let's just go to the picture. That's more fun. Um, black oil right here. Is this blocked for you all? Can you see behind this? Okay. Um, black oil here is kind of the standard black oil sunflower seed. If you're only going to have one seed out, that's probably the one to use. Lots of birds, big variety of birds, eat that seed, and you can buy them un you can buy them hulled as well. <clears throat> um, thistle seed right here. This is the tiny, little, very expensive seed, and People will tell you that if you want finches, you've got to have thistle seed. Well, finches love black oil also. Um, about the only time here on the Outer Banks that I use thistle seed are winters when we have a finch invasion. A finch invasion is when some of the northern species of finches that we don't normally have in the south come down for the winter due to a short food supply up north. Like right, right now, we're having pine siskins in our area. Pine siskins are smaller. They're about the size of a goldfish, but pine siskins are smaller finches and they have a tiny little bill and they just really love thistle seed. So that would be the time to use thistle seed. Otherwise, you can save your money. Um, you know, cracked corn is, is okay. It's, it's, um, it's cheap. It's good on the ground. If you throw mixed seed on the ground for the birds, you can throw some cracked corn. Um, it tends to attract blackbirds and grackles and things like that a lot, but morning doves like it and blue jays eat it. So cracked corn's okay. Um, this is, this is um, safflower. Safflower um, is more or less a sunflower seed substitute for people that have bad squirrel problems. Um, squirrels supposedly don't like safflower. Um, truth be told, birds don't like it as well as, as sunflower seeds either, but, but they, they sort of, sort of, a, a, sort of a, a, but, you know, they learn, to, they learn to eat it, especially cardinals like it after a while. Acquired taste, that's what I was trying to think of. It's an acquired taste. Um, <clears throat> peanuts are, peanuts are kind of good, kind of fun. Most people use them um, out of the shell. A lot of birds eat peanuts and peanut pieces. Um, millet, millet is a really good seed 
for most of the year. I don't recommend it in the summer. It just attracts a bunch of cowbirds. But if you want buntings from fall to spring, you should have a millet feeder out. Um, the, the indigo buntings that migrate through in the spring and fall eat it. And the painted buntings that we have here on the Outer Banks, that's all they'll eat. Um, and you can buy some good mixes. That's a good mixed seed. Um, most, mix, most mixes you buy locally at these box stores are not so good. They're full of the big brown, brown Milo seed that most birds just won't touch. <clears throat> um, there's just a few photos of some birds in action. Uh, there's some goldfinches on thistle feeder and pine siskin down at the bottom right. I had a bunch of those last week during the snowstorm. And there's an indigo bunting and a couple cardinals and a white-throated sparrow up, up there. Um, these are what painted buntings look like. Does anybody here have painted buntings at their feeders this year? Aha. I've been meaning to call you anyway. Um, there's, a, there's a lady friend of mine in Manjo that has eight right now. Eight painted buntings. How does she know there's eight? Because they all kind of look alike. Actually, they don't all look alike. The, the male's on the right and the female's on the left. Or the immatures look like the females. But it's because seven out of eight of hers are banded. They have these color bands on them. So she, she knows how many she has. Um, but they, they basically, they basically, this is, um, this is um, millet in this, tube, in this um, feeder here. The little small kind of white seed. That's a good seed to have in your mix. Um, that's, I've, I've had them several years at my house, and I've seen them at other people's houses. I've never seen them eat anything but millet. Now, I have no doubt they probably eat a, a hulled sunflower seed or maybe a little peanut chip, but I've never seen them pick up a sunflower seed in my life. So if you want a chance at painted buntings, then use millet. <clears throat> okay, um, they, I told you her birds were banded. They also banded them at my house once. This is one that was banded at my house years ago. Um, they're trying to figure out where these birds are coming from because painted buntings nest and live south of here. And then there's another population that lives southwest of here. And birds don't fly north for the winter. So why do we have them in, and we don't have them anytime but the winter. So why are they, why are they here? So anyway, they're, they're doing uh, banding studies. And they'll, they'll also, if you let them band your birds, they'll probably pluck a feather so they can do some DNA studies. Um, it doesn't hurt the bird. I've never heard of a case where the bird left. It might fly off in the bushes and sulk for a few hours, but it'll be back to your feeder, so there's no, no real risk of you losing the bird. So if you have any years that you have um, painted buntings and want to contact me, I'll be glad to put you in touch with somebody to band your birds because they really are trying to figure this out. <clears throat> um, if, when you're putting your bird seed out, you want to throw some on the ground, or I prefer a stump, just a sawed-off sawed -off log. Keeps it, keeps it off the wet ground, but a lot of birds like to feed on the ground. Um, and if you can, I don't know how well, can you see this seed mix under this blue jay? Mm -hmm. See the little brown balls? That's the Milo, that's what you don't want. That's your indication that you bought a lousy seed mix. <laughs> and sometimes you have to, you, I mean, you've got to have the seed, you're out and there's nowhere good, but the, the new, that, that nature store has got some good seed mixes. And see this, um, Photo of the tohi, see what's left on that stump? The same thing, that's what it didn't eat. Now, you, now don't, don't notice that the blue jay's got some in its bill. So I guess blue jays will eat anything. Um, peanuts, are, peanuts are kind of fun to feed the birds. Um, you can buy these little wire peanut feeders and there are lots and lots of birds that like peanuts, including the brown head nuthatch here and the titmouse. Suet feeders. Um, most birds do not eat bird seed, but a lot of the, in, the, the late, a lot of the insectiv insectivorous, is that the right word? A lot of the meat-eating birds will come to suet feeders. And you have your basic little wire basket here that holds a cake of suet, or you can move up and get a, a nicer double suet feeder if you're having lots of birds on your suet. You can buy suet feeders with a tail prop. This is for woodpeckers. Woodpeckers have those stiff tail feathers, and that helps them, gives them support when they're feeding. 
And if you, if you use it for a long time, you'll probably resort to an upside down feeder because the starlings, once they find your stuet, stuet, suet, are relentless and you want to keep your starlings away from eating your suet. So the upside down suet feeder pretty much keeps the starlings away. And here are some photos of some birds in my yard eating suet. The red-headed woodpecker photo is not winter. We don't have those in the winter. We only have them in the summer. <clears throat> but a lot of people will call this bird on the left a red-headed woodpecker because it's got some red on the head. In fact, the red on the male goes all the way up. But when you see a real red-headed woodpecker, then you never make that mistake again. <clears throat> but see, here's a pine warbler at the bottom left feeding on suet. And you, know, you don't think of warblers as coming to feeders, but they will come to suet. Um, peanut butter, kind of like suet. You attract the same kind of birds. Birds love peanut butter. Um, remember when you were a kid, did you, ever make the, did, you ever, did you ever stuff the pine cones with peanut butter and hang them up for the birds? Um, what, I, what, I, what I do at my house, I found, a little, I found a small piece of driftwood that has three little hands sticking out. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, that's perfect for peanut butter. So I put a little screw eye in it and hang it up. And I don't just feed them peanut butter on a regular basis all the time. It's kind of like a treat. It's kind of like giving your cat a treat when you come home. I'll come home in the afternoon and put a tablespoon of peanut butter on the feeder. And I swear, so many times, by the time I get in the house and look out the window, there's already a bird on there. I mean, the feeder is still swinging and there's a bird already sitting there. They love peanut butter. And it's, you know, it's kind of a natural looking um, feeder for taking photographs more so than something made out of plastic and wire. Um, speaking of peanut butter, here's jelly, peanut butter jelly. Um, there are jelly and orange um, Oriole feeders you can buy. I had one for several years before a raccoon tore it up, but um, oranges are a real big hit down in the southern states. If you ever go birding down in South Texas, everybody's got oranges out, and the birds just come to the oranges and just eat them up. I haven't had a lot of luck in North Carolina with oranges, but um, so they usually get them when they're half dried up and I'm not going to eat it. But the jellies, jellies another story. A lot of birds like to eat the jelly, but especially Orioles. Orioles have a sweet tooth and love the jelly. And, and we get Orioles at our feeders mostly fall and fall, and if you're lucky, you'll, you can have them stay over in the winter. Um, mealworms, usually people that have good populations of bluebirds We'll, we'll use mealworms because bluebirds love mealworms. Other birds eat them though. Carolina wrens like them too. You can buy mealworms. You can buy them live. You know, you can buy them all squirmy and wiggly, and you actually can then grow them yourself. You can, you can Google it and find out. It's containers with oat and fruit, and you know you can grow you can grow the um, mealworms yourself, or you can buy them dried and just do it the simple way. <clears throat> That's why that slides in there, just to get a laugh. <laughs> Bird feeders can come in some unusual shapes sometimes. A, a friend gave Joan this feeder years ago, and it actually had wings when it was brand new. And, and just happened to get a cardinal in a cardinal photo one time. It's just kind of funny. Um, nectar feeders, or what you'd call hummingbird feeders. Nice variety of those these days, too. What they'll do to take our money. <clears throat> um, the, the standard, this is what you see everywhere. It's not necessarily because it's the best. It's what the box stores have. It's what's become popular. But it's, it's a glass bottle with, with the little deal that screws on the bottom. And then there, there are some other ones. There's some improvements on it, like right here. Um, you can buy, I like the saucer feeders. I'll explain that in a little while. You can buy these the various saucer feeders. Uh, most of them have a built-in ant moat, a little area where you fill, that you fill with water and then the ants can't get to your feeder. Um, you can buy feeders that suction cup to your window. That's nice and convenient when it's raining or snowing and you need to change the feeder. You can open the window and get it. And um, if you don't learn anything else tonight, I'm sure you all already know this, but 
please never use that pre-mixed, pre-made red dye. It's more expensive. They think that the red dye may hurt the kidneys of the hummingbirds. It does no good. You don't have to have the red dye to attract hummingbirds because the feeders are red. So um, it's very easy to make um, hummingbird nectar, just the four to one ratio, four parts water, one part sugar. You know, I take a two cup Pyrex measuring cup, fill it with two cups of water, put it in the microwave, get it hot, put a half a cup of sugar in it, mix it up. As soon as it's cooled off, you can put it out. A lot cheaper than buying the, the pre-made stuff. Um, another re really important thing is that feeders really need to be kept clean and the nectar changed twice a week. You need to at least clean the feeders once a week and change the nectar twice a week, especially in, during hot weather. You kind of can get by in the winter with changing the nectar once a week. Um, but it's disturbing. It seems like half the feeders I see out in the public are these big giant feeders filled with red nectar and they've already gotten all cruddy and dirty. And you can just imagine they've sat there for months and the person's saying, well, what's wrong with that? They haven't drank all the nectar yet. Why do I need to? If, if, you're, if you're not gonna take care of your hummingbirds by keeping things clean, then it's better just to put your feeders away, not even have them. There's no, no reason to sicken the little birds. Um, a lot of people think that um, you gotta take your feeders in in the fall so the hummingbirds will migrate but they've proven that this isn't true. Just like all other birds that migrate, they use the day length as their indicator, their indication of when to go. So um, we do have ruby throats that spend the winter on the Outer Banks. And so a lot of us leave our, leave our feeders up year round. In fact, I have at least four at my house right now and that's usually more than I have in the summer. So um, you can leave your feeders up year round. The main reason I do it is um, I'm always hoping to attract some rare species, and I have had three species at my house. But this is a list here, this list here, this 11 species of hummingbirds have been documented in North Carolina. It's, it's almost always, I guess it is always, that's, I'm sure that's all at someone's feeder. So if you, if you do get a strange hummingbird, and you know it's a strange hummingbird, please, uh, please, please feel free to call me anytime. You know, you read your old bird book when you were a kid, or last week, either one, and it says we have one hummingbird east of the, east of the Mississippi. Well, we only have one that breeds here, but they do visit. Okay, what's wrong with this picture? Red dye. That's the number one thing that that's um, horrible about it. Number two is that it's look how full it is. So you know that feeder is going to sit there a long time because they're not going to. Well, they're hummingbirds at least on the Outer Banks. Now, there's more hummingbirds inland. I mean, they have swarms of hummingbirds inland. Here on the Outer Banks, we just get a few. So they're not ever going to drink all that nectar in three to four days, are they? So you're going to have to pour it out. So then why fill it up that full? And also, this feeder probably has 12 different pieces to it, 12 different parts. To clean this feeder, you know, you've got to take those bee guards out, and you've got to pull the red flowers off, then you've got to unscrew the base from the glass. Then you've got that glass bottle to have to clean and with a, with a narrow opening. That, now, they do make them now with larger openings. But anyway, it's just a pain. So why not? Oh, we figured that out. So um, why not just use a saucer feeder? These things hold three or four or five, six ounces. They come in different sizes. The hummingbirds love them. Um, they have a built-in ant moat. And they're only, other than, the wire, other, than, other than the hanger, they're only two pieces. You just lift the top off, two pieces. Even the flowers are, are molded in. I mean, they don't even need those. These, all these frills and things are for the consumer. They're not for the hummingbird. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you want to have a perpetual flower in your yard, provides nectar year-round, I recommend these saucer feeders. I'm not going to mention brands or anything. It doesn't really matter, but... Um, just get one that looks sturdy and has the ant mode in the middle. And um, so much easier. Easy peasy. Um, our winter hummingbirds need some dense cover to roost in. It's cold at night. They like their privacy. Um, if you have some bushes with vines growing up on them, that's a really good place. If you have a really sterile environment and don't have any cover, 
You may not get as many hummingbirds. <coughs> Although I'm a native plant advocate, it's kind of nice having camellias in the winter. The hummingbirds do feed around the, the blooms. <clears throat> not, only, not only taking the nectar in, they also eat the little insects that are in the flowers. And this is also a good place for them to, to, to perch during the day. <coughs> nice and dense. Um, Orioles also show up at nectar feeders. Um, they even make them orange colored for Orioles with a, with a bigger hole, bigger hole for the beak to go in. So, um, in fact, um, Joan and I have a friend in Raleigh right now that's got 15 Baltimore Orioles spending the winter with her. Every year, they're, they're very faithful. They, they come back and, you know, they bring their friends and she's got 15 Baltimore Orioles in her, in her yard. <coughs> <clears throat> but the same nectar, same deal, same, same rules. But you, if you can get, um, anybody here have a Baltimore Oriole this winter in their yard? Yeah. You all have that, you have everything in your yard. <clears throat> um, water is a much better way to attract a big variety of birds to your yard than feeders are. It's like, it's like I said earlier, a lot of birds, most birds don't eat bird seed. But they all have to have water. So having um, clean, especially moving water um, year-round is very important. And um, I discovered these little drips, gosh, a long time ago. They're little irrigation, little irrigation drips. You can um, run one up on a piece of driftwood and let it drip down into your bird bath, you know, from three feet away or so, and it makes a nice little bloop, bloop every time. And the birds can actually hear it from a long ways away, and it really attracts the birds. This is a good way to get warblers and vireos and all these birds that you don't even know you have in your yard because they stay up in the treetops. Oh, one, one more thing. Uh, and I've seen, birds, I've seen birds sitting in the bird bath with a drip hitting them right on the back, and they're just sitting there. I don't know if they're unaware or if it's kind of like a shower, but they're a lot of fun. And, and the, birds, you know, the birds do le learn to drink out of them, which is kind of neat. You know, they're getting, they're getting clean water. They're drinking that clean drop instead of drinking out of the bird bath where the robins just left. <laughs> and, and this is all you have to have. You can, go to, you can go to Lowe's or Home Depot around here. You just need some quarter-inch tubing, a little emitter. Like I said, this is irrigation. This is um, a little spike that you stick in the ground, and then there's a little adjustment valve on the top where you can, it can spray out, or in, in the case of drippers, you want to tighten it down real tight so that it just drips a slow drip. And so you, you, know, you, plug, you plug that into the end of your tubing and you plug the other end into this. This is just a, an adapter so that you can screw it into your spigot. And, and there you have it. Um, what you do, what I've done, this is an old picture of my yard. Um, you, find a, you find a decorative piece of driftwood, you put it over your bird bath, which that's my bird bath, and then you run the the spigot is here where, where you're sitting. It's buried underground. I've got it coming up on the back side of the driftwood. I've got it pinned to the back side so you can't see it. And then it drips from right here, and it's dripping right on that bullfrog. <laughs> I have bullfrogs that, get, that try to eat my birds every summer, and they succeed sometimes. But having a drip keeps the water refreshed. I won't say keeps it fresh, where this is a computer age, but it keeps it refreshed. And keeps the mosquitoes out. You don't have to clean it as often. And then the water, you know, kind of drizzles down into my pond. And you notice in my pond, I've got a little bubbly fountain keeping the water moving. That helps keep the mosquitoes away, too. Of course, I have minnows in my pond. That does a good job. But anyway, I, I highly, highly recommend the drips. <clears throat> Especially if you're on well water. Um, brush piles are another good way to attract birds to your yard. There are lots of birds that would practically live in those brush piles. And, you know, if a hawk comes screaming into your yard to catch a bird, they've got somewhere they can hide. If it's cold, they've got somewhere they can, they can sit. Um, they can roost there at night. But, you know, sparrows and wrens and cardinals all, all love brush piles. So don't be so darn neat when you're cleaning up your yard. <laughs> it, it, these, some of these things do depend on where you live. You know, some people are in neighborhoods where you... They would tar and feather you if you did that. Um, another thing, though, um, if you can leave part of your yard unraked, there are a lot of ground-feeding birds that love to scratch through the leaves and find their own food. 
I noticed just last week when the snow started to melt and there were little patches of, of leaves on the ground, my birds left the feeders and went out scratching around in the, in the woods for food. They like to find their own food. So um, besides the leaves, you know, leaves are nourished to earth anyway. If everybody rakes their leaves up, we're going to lose all our good soil. Okay, we're going to change to midwinter. That's where we are now. Midwinter is, if we get any cold weather on the Outer Banks, if we get any snow, it's usually going to be during this period, although not necessarily. Um, <clears throat> thanks for some pretty pictures. So here's a Carolina wren eating this cold peanut butter. Another blue jay. It's a robin down by the edge of my pond. <clears throat> Some more snow pictures. This is a little oven bird that I've had at my house. Um, this is a neotropical migrant. This is a wood warbler. They're supposed to be in Central America. And at least six or seven winters now over the past 15 years, I've had one that spent the winter with me. And I didn't even know I had one this year until it snowed, and here he comes walking out. I mean, they're about, they're about this big, tail and all. And they walk like a little wind-up toy. They just walk slow and steady. And they're just adorable little birds, but it's not a feeder bird. But, but they're coming to my feeder year after year. They're coming to my feeder. So what do we do about hummingbirds that we're, what do we do about hummingbirds that we're feeding in the winter and then you get these snowstorms? Well, I'll tell you what we do. We build a little heater. Actually, actually there are several things you can do. Some, some people I know have focus of floodlight right down on the feeder, I mean, just from inches away. And I've heard of using um, heating tape for pipes on feeders. Um, but I, I built this years ago. The, the prototype was with an old metal coffee can. But then I found this piece of um, blue, blue pipe laying beside the road somewhere. And it was nice and thick and heavy. <clears throat> and what I've done, I don't know how well you can see, but what I've done is drilled three holes in the top and put a hanging basket wire on here. And then you drill a hole right here, vertically across, across the diameter, and you put a, a heavy-duty piece of wire on there and bend the ends. And that's where your shop light hangs. Your shop light hangs on this wire. And then you find some kind of something. This is a microwave bowl. Now I'm using a coffee can lid. You find something that'll fit that, that lip. And then you place your feeder in it, just like this. So your feeder doesn't hang anymore. It's sitting. So you hang your hanging basket hanger. And, um, you know, a 60 or 75 watt, watt bulb will keep your um, hummingbird feeder from freezing up. Very simple. You can give the shop light back to your husband when you're through. <laughs> <clears throat> Otherwise, if you've, if you've tried to, if you've um, experienced keeping feeders thawed during 20 some degree temperatures in the snow, you really have to change them out about every 45 minutes. I mean, they get slushy and cold. And hummingbirds, just like the other birds, hummingbirds don't eat us. They're fine without, our, without the feeders, except in that kind of weather. That's when they do need us. So that's the one time, if it's cold, that's not the time to say, well, they're on their own today. That's the one time of the year you need to take care of those little, little critters. Um, you may want to purchase a bird bath heater. Keep your birds. We've already talked about how important water is, not if it's hard. Um, this photo right here, why is there a hole in the middle of that? Did I get out there and chisel a hole? No, that's where my drip was dripping. That's where my drip was dripping. I, I sped the drip up a little bit more because it was cold, and it actually kept the middle of the bird bath thawed out. In fact, the water was a lot lower than the ice, and the birds would hop down and disappear out of sight and bathe down there, and then they come out again. <laughs> so, um, but middle of the winter, it's, it's cold. The Super Bowls might be on, might be off. Um, it's a good time of year to do some planning, research some new plants, dream a little bit, design a new garden. Um, do, you can do soil samples this time of year. You can do them any time of the year, but um, if, if you... You know, soil samples are important. Just see what's going on in your yard. They'll let you know what nutrients you, you have or are lacking. They'll let you know if you need lime or not. Um, it's free most of the year. During the winter months, it's a $4 fee, but it's still well worth doing. 
And I've got somewhere around here, I've got some forms and some boxes you can take home if you'd like. <clears throat> another, another fun thing to do in the winter is um, that I've already alluded to is dream and plan about what you want to plant the next year. You can go to the local stores and buy seeds. You can order them from catalogs. Just keep in mind that some things will have to wait until it warms to sow. Other things you can start in your house a few weeks early. Some, some seeds may have to be stratified. They have, need to have that cold period. So, um, and and I'll, beware, on, I've noticed on seed packs for years, beware of the planting depth, they tell you. Some seed packs will just say, Half inch deep, half inch deep. And if it's a little tiny seed, like a speck of dust, you've buried that thing for life. Um, basically, basically, tiny little seeds are on top of the soil. Some of them even need light to germinate. And then the larger the seed, the deeper they go. <clears throat> um, quick, write all this down. Um, th th here's, this is a list of some good native perennials and vines for birds. Um, you also can go on this website, oops, website right there, um, nc.audubon.org. They have, they have some great bird lists, all kinds of great bird information on there. Also, some of this is on a couple of the handouts that I had. But, um, and then there are also lots of good native shrubs and trees for birds. I mean, I, I can simplify this real easy. If it's a native plant that's indigenous to your area, then it's good for wildlife. What you mainly see in the list are plants that provide, you know, you know, food, berries or nuts or something like that for the, for the birds. But there are lots of good native plants out there that provide other things, like oak trees, although some birds do eat, eat acorns, but like oak trees provide all this food for caterpillars in the spring. The warblers come through in migration and they feed in the tops of the oak trees because they're hosting all these caterpillars. So if it's a native tree and it's indigenous to your area, it's a good thing. <clears throat> um, we're, remember, we're in midwinter now. We're, we're like we are now here. It's the 18th of February. You still can plant or transplant um, dormant trees and shrubs as long as the ground will allow you to, as long as it isn't frozen solid. Still not too late. Um, this is a good time of year to get in the garage and build things if you're a carpenter or go buy them or order them if you're not. Um, you know, fences or trellises, arbors, birdhouses. It'll get you excited about spring. It's also a good time, weather permitting, to go outside and tackle those cool season weeds that have come up. You may have thought your garden was weed free when you when you walked away in the fall, but cold weather brings out things like chickweed. <clears throat> okay, now it's late winter. We're moving along because we're ready for spring. It's late winter now, which is, you know, sometime late February until spring. The Outer Banks, you know, the weather here is so finicky. We can not even have winter some years. So these are vague categories. Um, but it's late winter. You can have really bad cold weather. You can still have snow. But the days are getting longer. Birds are actually starting to sing. Buds are swelling. You may have crocus popping up. Um, it's an exciting time of year. This was, when I was going through my slides, I thought, well, this is the same day. This was today, last year. Do you remember that terrible freeze we had last year and the sound froze? And, oh, you just never know. Um, but late winter, before grasses get to growing, this is when you want to cut back these warm season grasses, like your purple muley grass. And I can't go into pruning a whole lot. That could be a whole other program, just pruning. Um, but um, this is also a good time of year to prune um, woody plants that bloom on new growth, things like crepe myrtles. Um, you basically want to prune, you want to prune away any dead or Injured, damaged, diseased wood, anything bad like that, get rid of that first. Um, crossing branches, you don't want branches that rub against each other when the wind's blowing. Um, weak branches, you want to you prune suckers or water sprouts from, from most of your plants, most of your trees and shrubs. 
Um, you may prune to shape your plant. You may want a certain shape. You may prune to control the size. Um, a good reason to prune is to let in more light and air. That's a good thing. And you may prune, well, anytime you prune, you invigorate the plant. Pruning does invigorate the plant, stimulates growth. <clears throat> and when you are pruning, if you're working on bigger stuff, if you're pruning trees or have a, if you have a dead tree or if you have dead limbs, if they're not near the kids' playground or they're not near the driveway or the house, if, you, if they're on the back 40 and you can leave them, please leave some standing. The woodpeckers will certainly appreciate it. They nest in those dead trees. Um, this is a hydrangea. I think, I guess you can tell that. Um, this is a deciduous shrub, and it, it's, it's nice to prune them this time of year because you can see better. You know, when they had the leaves on them, you couldn't tell what was what. Now you can tell what's dead and what's alive. They're starting to bud out. They're getting their new growth here. Um, you could have deadheaded them back in the late summer or fall, but if you didn't, go ahead and do it now. What you can do is you can cut the, the stems back to that first bud. Cut each one back to wherever the first bud is. Just cut them back. And then you can go inside, and any really weak, puny little stems like that right there, any puny ones that just aren't going to mount anything, you can cut those out. And once you get a big established hydrangea, you actually want to go in every year and cut two or three of the really big stems out too right at the base because what they'll do, and I'm sure what most of you have seen, is they'll get to a certain age and they'll just split anyway. So just go ahead. If you, if you go ahead and stay ahead of the program and, and cut the big ones out too, That'll encourage, that, that energy will go into the plant and that'll encourage um, more younger, vigorous growth. <clears throat> now you can go out in the garden and cut all your perennials down to the ground like you've been wanting. It's, um, it's almost spring. The birds are done with them. The seeds have fallen off. You can go ahead and cut them down to the, to the basil growth or whatever you've got there. Clean up, your, clean up your flower beds. Get the debris out. <clears throat> it's a good time to, this is a good time to fertilize shrubs and trees. I'm not going to go into what fertilizer you use for what, but remember your soil samples, that would help. Um, but there are organic fertilizers, there are chemical fer fertilizers, there are time-release fertilizers, liquid fertilizers, um, spikes you can drive them to the ground. Um, I recommend compost. <laughs> Here's that darn clump of uh, swamp sunflower again. Spring, late, late, late winter, early spring, this is also a good time to divide perennials. You know, you can do it in the fall, early winter. You can do it in the late winter, spring. <clears throat> um, I would keep an eye on those cool season weeds that we were talking about. You don't want them to start blooming and go to seed or your troubles will be multiplied. And it's also time, this is exciting, it's, time, it's, it's an exciting time of year when it's time to clean out the birdhouses and put up the Purple Martin house and all that. It means spring's almost here. Um, you may want to put a baffle on your pole or on your 4x4. Four four. They come in different styles. I think this is mainly designed for squirrels, although it works for raccoons too. But squirrels will get up and chew the hole right out. They'll make an inch and a half perfect bluebird hole into a two and a half inch squirrel hole. And, and so what you can do to remedy that is you can put these little metal plates that you can buy, you know, right over your hole, right over the hole. And, and you buy these, you know, you order them by the size, you know, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, whatever size you need. But um, squirrel can't chew through that. But you do want to clean out any of the old nesting material from the year before. And I think most people put up their bluebird houses I think you're supposed to time it right. You don't want to put them up too early so that the house sparrows will move in, but you want to time it right for when the, when the Purple Martins first get here. Um, if you didn't have a hummingbird, hummingbird feeder out all winter, now's the time to put that up. And if it doesn't have an ant moat, you may want to add an ant moat. That's, that's these little cup things that um, you fill with water. And you hang, the, you hang the hummingbird feeder from down below, and then the ants come down and they can't cross the moat. 
I don't know how that one works. There are a lot of different styles. Um, you may want to put a baffle over your feeder. I like, I like the ones that are solid. This is a metal one because they block at least, at least a little bit of the sun. But, but any of them at least will shelter your feeder from you know, some of the weather like the rain. So basically you've got this on top, then you hook that to it, then you hook this to that. <clears throat> and you use nice, clear nectar like they've got in that one. And of course, you know, spring when you're cleaning everything else and you're getting out in the yard, it's real easy to just go over and clean your bird baths and get them ready for the spring. And um, it's helpful to put a rock, it helps the birds if you put a rock in your bird baths. Sometimes birds, apparently, they can't judge the water depth very well. And so a rock gives them added comfort. They'll, they'll, a lot of times they'll land on the rock first and then they'll, then they'll jump in the bird bath. That's a Baltimore Oriole. It's spring. Hooray. Do you all have any questions? And it's right around the corner, too. If you have a question, hold it until Nathan can get you the microphone. Yes, David. How do you catch those buntings to band them? I don't. Um, when, when the man came to my house, he, used, he set up a, a mist net with the little pockets like they, like they use at banding stations. But I've, but I've heard other people say that they put up a trap like they do for hummingbirds. They'll put up a trap, open the door, and put the feeder inside, and then the bird will fly into the trap, and they'll pull the string, and the door will fall. So it, a couple of different ways, but um, nothing that's real harmful to the bird. I'm sure it ticks them off for a while. <laughs> when, yes, Robert? When are you going to do the spring program? Uh, in the fall? <laughs> Is, I see on one of these lists Asclepias or milkweed. Is there a particular type that does best here on the Outer Banks? You know, I just saw that on the bird list and was surprised. I don't know why that's on a bird list. Um, unless they eat the caterpillars that you don't want them to eat. <clears throat> but no, um, I would say any of them... Is, I mean, if you, if you talk about the monarchs, any of them but the tropical ones, you want to use any of several species that are native. So um, I, I just wouldn't use the tropical species. Anybody else? Hi. You were really focusing um, on the birds and attracting the birds to your yard. What about butterflies? Is there anything that we should be doing especially for them. I get an awful lot of butterflies in my yard, but other than Joe Pye weed and a few other things, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm lost. Um, my short answer is another program. Um, there's lots of, you can Google all kinds of information. There are lots of um, books on the subject. I'm actually gonna be planting a pollinator garden out here this spring, hopefully. Um, here again, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, you could write a book. It would take a book to answer that question. But here again, stick with native plants as much as you can to attract pollinators. But there, there's a lot more information out there now than there used to be. You can, you can Google pollinator plants and just there's a cornucopia of information out there. And you can, you can, you can, uh, you can email me if you like and we can discuss it further. Yes, Jim. So if you don't have time to cultivate your own native plants by collecting seeds on your property, um, where's the best place to go purchase you know, larger sized native plants, meaning not necessarily shrubs and trees, but plants that are grown a little more? Um, Kathy, so Mitchell, Kathy Mitchell at the aquarium has a plant sale once or twice a year. She sells native plants. <clears throat> They're not necessarily large ones. Um, you could talk to Sherry Foreman over at Nature's Harmony and see if she could find them for you. There are lots of online sources. Actually, they're very hard to find. Um, 
I've been researching, researching native plant sources for months now on rainy days out here. Um, it's it's going to take me five or six different sources to find the plants I need for, the, um, for my pollinator garden. They're just not readily available usually, but um, just keep asking for them. Maybe eventually uh, more nurseries will supply them if we keep asking for them. I live in Kitty Hawk Woods, have about 12 different kinds of trees on our property. They spit out a zillion seeds in the spring, and I swear, everyone germinates. Now, if I let them all live, it would look like the dismal swamp without the water. So I have to do away with them. What are the chances of them turning into healthy trees if I pot them up? Do they pot up? What, well, what kind of trees are they? Oh, everything. Oak and beech and sassafras and dogwood, hollies, maples. Yeah, you can pot them up. Just the sooner you pot them up, the better as far as size. You know, it's easier to move a small plant than it is a large plant. Do they have to be a certain <clears throat> size, like six no, inches? No, I'm just saying you don't want a tree to get a big, long right. tap root or something and then try to move it. It's easier if you dug up 100 trees this big you might have 10 that live. If you dug up 100 this big, you might have 95 that live. So um, you're lucky, though. I might have to come over and, uh, oh, and uh, collect do. a few. Oh, my. You're see, welcome. See me after class. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody is welcome. <laughs> you hear that? Field, field trip next weekend. <laughs> hey, Bill. Good Jeff, to see you. Thank you. <clears throat> Jeff, are there... Is there bird life that is we're more likely to see out here at Coastal Studies in our environment than we're going to see in town? Absolutely. And when, when is the best time for that? Well, I've only been here since the end of September. I've got about 90 species on my CSI bird list so far. Um, it's all about habitat. You know, it's all about habitat. We've got this tremendous salt marsh around us that has rails and all kinds of sparrows and things that you, you just don't even see. You, you may hear them. There's, right now, there's, there's a nice variety of sparrows that live all out here around these, these um, grassy areas. As far as the best time of year, it would have to be during the spring and fall migration. Because, I mean, we don't have... <clears throat> it's just all about habitat. And we have some woods on one side it would attract woodland species, and we would have year-round species there, like your backyard cardinals and blue jays. Um, around, you know, around the little ponds we have, we get occasional um, herons and egrets and shorebirds. Um, and being, being, being a real open environment like this, I'm looking forward to all the things that are going to fly over that I'm hoping to see next, next year. Does that answer your question? Yes, it's, it's all about habitat and microhabitats and time of year and... Anybody else? Going, going, gone. Well, thank you so much again for coming out. <laughs>